Well, uh, hello everyone. So welcome to uh, today's uh, Magnets uh, seminar. Um, I'm filling in for Greg today in case you're not familiar with, with this face. Um, so if you're new to Magnets, uh, it starts with these uh, 30 minute uh, presentations. Uh, um, during it, we ask that you keep your microphones muted just so everyone can hear the presenter. Uh, we found that if you're having bandwidth issues and the quality is poor, sometimes it helps to turn off your own video, make sure that you're muted and uh, that can improve it. Uh, following the, the presentation, there'll be a, a question discussion period for 10, 15 minutes or so. If you don't wanna uh, voice your questions over chat uh, um, or over the microphone, you can always use the, the chat feature in Zoom. You can type it out. And especially if you add no mic, to the, uh, to the little text uh, chat, then uh, one of the conveners will read it out for you. Um, you know, we're still doing everything remotely. Um, lots of people are still working at home, life goes on. So uh, feel free to leave if you have to leave, just you know, can just get up and go. And um, since these seminars are gonna be recorded, you can always catch the rest of it uh, online. And, and just, yes, as a reminder, these are recorded. So um, if you, you don't want to kind of be part of that, you just keep your camera off and keep your microphone muted. And then um, after the, the discussion period, there'll be a bit of a, a time for like a bit of a social, um, uh, kind of just a, a catch up. And uh, that's not gonna be recorded. And hopefully it's just a nice chance to see how people are doing. Um, and so without much more delay, uh, we're really excited to present um, Claire Nichols uh, from, from Oxford now, and uh, she'll be talking about uh, paleomagnetic record in uh, palisites, which I'm excited to see. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Claire. Wow, thank you very much. Um, just sharing the screen. Um, can you all see that on the laser pointer? Is that all, all good? Yeah, it yeah. looks great. Cool. Ah. Um, okay, hi everyone. Thank you very much for being here, whatever time of day it is with you. Um, so today I want to talk to you guys about um, kind of a very long-term project. This is something I've been working on since I was an undergrad. Um, so basically looking at palisite meteorites, their paleomagnetic record and what that can tell us about their, their parent body. Um, so this is kind of all of the data I've collected in the last, I don't know, seven years or so. Um, and thanks to lockdown um, last year, I was stuck in my parents' living room and finally had time to kind of sit down, run some models and try and make sense of it all and what, what we can say from it. Um, so I'll try and kind of briefly go through through the paper that's just been just been published in JDR Planets if you want to get into the details, um, but kind of give you an overview of that today. Um, Okay, so to start with, oh, if I can actually make my screen go forward. Um, so just a little overview of actually what a palisite meteorite is for those that are not so familiar um, with the world of meteorites. So they're these really, really beautiful stony iron meteorites. Um, and they basically just consist of olivine crystals in an iron nickel matrix. So they're very, very distinctive and very kind of simple in terms of their mineralogy. And for a long time, people thought that they were representative of the core mantle boundary. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because they're this intimate mix of, of metal and silicates. So that was very intuitive. But then us paleomagnetists kind of got involved and, and ruined that idea. Um, and so the reason that we no longer think this can be true is because obviously to be driving a dynamo um, and a magnetic field within the parent body, you have to have this molten metallic core that's vigorously convecting. And so if the palisites were from the core mantle boundary, they'd have to be below their Curie temperature, so below kind of 500 Celsius and right next to that convecting core. So you'd have way too big a temperature gradient in there um, and it doesn't really make much sense. So we now think they're probably not from the core mantle boundary, um, and so in the last decade, there have been quite a lot of ideas of how they might have formed if this, if this isn't the answer. So one idea that's been put forward is that they could be impact melts. Um, so if you have a collision between two planetesimals that are both differentiated, 
Um, you could inject some cool material from one into the mantle of the other, and that might give you this kind of texture. Um, it's also quite recently been argued that there could be um, kind of elements of incomplete differentiation. Um, so if you have kind of metal traps within the olivine grains that can't percolate through to the core, um, then that could explain some of the textures we see. Um, or it could be some combination of the two. So you could have incomplete differentiation and an impact, and that could explain why we see so much variation in the textures in terms of sometimes metals interconnected, sometimes the olivine is, sometimes the olivines are rounded, sometimes they're angular. Um, so there's lots of kind of textual complexity that we need to, need to understand. Um, and then again, quite recently, it's been suggested that actually if the inner core is liquid and the outer core is solid, um, then you could actually have kind of sulfur rich metallic dikes coming up um, from within the core and intruding into the mantle. And these metallic dikes would then incorporate all of you. Um, and that, that could be why we get this texture. Um, and this is something that's of particular interest at the moment because this might be what Psyche um, looks like. This is an asteroid that there's a mass emission to um, in the next couple of years, which we think is mostly metallic but has a thin mantle. Um, so it might be it might be a good analogy for that. Okay, so how do we fit into all of this? Um, so my talk's kind of in four sections. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about the different paleomagnetic approaches we've used over the years um, to try and actually extract paleo intensities um, from the palisites. And then I will talk about how we've used that paleo intensity record to constrain the thermal evolution and the parasite parent body. And then I will finish by discussing whether any of those models for parasite formation make sense with paleo intensity records that we have. Okay, so I've used basically two approaches um, to look at paleomagnetism in parasites. The first is kind of a more standard one in terms of looking at olivine crystals and magnetic inclusions within them, so kind of single critical paleo intensity approaches. Um, and then the second is looking at these microstructures that form um, in the metal. So I'm sure some of you have heard me bang on about the cloud zone for years and years and years. I'm not going to go into details of what it is right now. We can talk about that afterwards if people are interested. Um, but essentially, there's very, very magnetically stable regions within the metal um, on this, this microstructure of the cloud zone that we studied in particular. So we studied five parasites, um, all from the main group, so they're all chemically similar, um, and we think they all come from, from the same parent body. And the size of the microstructures that form um, in the metal is an indicator of how quickly these, these meteorites cool. So we have a range of cooling rates from three degrees Celsius per million years up to around seven and a half. Um, so the real thing here to note is that all of these cooling rates are extremely slow. Um, so even a small difference of one degree per million years is a massive difference in actually when these things reach the same, the same temperature. And so by using these differences in cooling rates, so here I'm showing you a temperature versus time plot, so the gradient of each of these lines um, is basically corresponds to the cooling rate. Um, means that they reach the tainite blocking temperature, so that's the, the inclusions in the olivines. Um, and the tetracaline ordering temperature, which is when the cloudy zone requires a magnetic field, each of the palisites will reach these temperatures at a different time and give us this time resolved record. So I can now show you what this record looks like. So now I've got paleo intensity, micro Tesla um, on the y axis, and then on the x axis, I've still got time and when each of our five palisites has reported a record. So the first study that was done on the parasites was done by the Rochester Group um, and John Tardino back in 2012. And they um, primarily focused on the, the magnetic inclusions within the olivine crystals. And they recovered really, really quite intense um, paleo intensities. And so that was the first study that said, hang on guys, actually this thing has an active dynamo. Um, so really they were the first ones to spoil the four mantle boundary origin um, idea. So that got us interested, and this was actually um, work I did for my master's um, back a long time ago, 
Um, and so we were trying to use a new technique to actually get paleo intensity from the cloudy zone. And so we thought this was the perfect opportunity to try and calibrate the two. So we had paleo intensity from the olivines. Now let's see if we get something similar um, from the cloudy zone. And you can see that we have good agreement um, between these paleo intensities. Um, I then went on to measure Martellati and Brennan, which have an earlier record. And they fall below this horizontal dashed line, um, which is basically the, the minimum paleo intensity that we can distinguish from zero fields. So these are basically within area of zero. It doesn't look like they've recorded um, one thing particularly um, profound in terms of strong paleo intensity. And then finally, um, I kind of filled in the gap in the middle and measured spring water, again, the cloudy zone, um, and got an intensity of around 20 microtesla. And the thing you'll probably notice here is the fact that the error bars for spring water are significantly smaller than they are for inlet in the scale. This is much, much better constrained. Um, and the reason for that is because we significantly improved and developed our methods for actually extracting pale intensities from the canopy zone um, over the years. So again, I'm not going to go into this in a huge amount of detail. Um, but the method we use is XPEAM, which is um, X-ray photo emission electron microscopy. So it's a synchrotron technique. Um, and essentially what it allows us to do is image the direction of magnetization um, in a polished metallic surface. Um, so we get these red, white, and blue maps. The cloudy zone is this dappled region here. And then what we do is we measure how the magnetization directions are distributed um, within that field and we see if we have a bias. Um, so any bias is telling us that the cloudy zone grew in the presence of a, an external magnetic field. So previously what we did was we measured one orientation and we got one set of histograms out. Um, and that only allows you to partially constrain how strong the field was, you only get minimum estimate on the paleo intensity by doing that. Um, so that's why the error bars fit in like an scale are so big, because we don't know how close to the true paleo intensity we were measuring. We just know that they have recorded a field. So now what we do is measure in three orientations, all about 120 degrees apart. And that allows us to fully resolve um, the REM magnetic field vector um, from these maps. Um, so we can calculate the intensity for each orientation and we can use that to, to fully constrain the intensity. And the other nice thing that we can now do is actually resolve the direction. So we can now convince ourselves that the field that we're measuring in the power of the zone is unidirectional. So that's kind of a very brief overview of what we've done with the power zone paleo intensity. Um, but then I wanted to talk a bit about why we bothered to use a synchrotron method um, and a kind of a new technique um, when we've got olivines, which we can measure in a much more standard way um, in their magnetic inclusions. Um, and so we've, we've also done this. Um, and my motivation for doing this really was, um, again, it gives us this independent calibration um, on our synchrotron technique. Um, and we can use much more familiar approaches. So we can use telia telia experiments um, and heat these samples up and, and recover um, the intensity. So it's kind of much more familiar ground. And because the magnetic carriers in the olivines are slightly different, um, it actually means they record before the cloudy zone. So if we get a record from the olivine and the metal, then that increases the resolution. We then have 10 data points essentially instead of five. So we tried to do um, AF demagnetization um, on samples of spring water in inalak olivines. Um, and this is actually one of the best side effects I've got. So there are, there are, uh, there are resolvable components, um, but you can see that they're actually completely demagnetized at really quite low alternating fields. So around 20 microtesla that we can't lost from all, all of the stable signal in these samples. And here I'm plotting up the low coercivity and high coercivity components um, in blue and red um, for spring water and for Imalac. And you can see that we couldn't get anything that looked unidirectional. These are really, really unstable, um, very difficult to interpret. So AF um, experiments didn't really work. 
Um, and again, we try to do fidelity tests, so applying a known laboratory field, um, and then basically seeing if we could if we could extract that paleo intensity again. Um, so if these were ideal recorders, they all sit along this black line. That's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, and you can see they're kind of all over the place. So none of them uh, really meet our fidelity criteria, which would mean they would sit in this green box. Um, they start to for very, very strong fields of 200 microtons in liquid in reality. So we quite quickly realized that AFD magnesium these samples was not going to give us any results. Um, so then we tried more standard techniques. Um, so we did some Izzy Telia Telia experiments in a controlled atmosphere. Um, so we're doing this in kind of a standard paleomagnetic oven um, with a CO2 H2 atmosphere to control the fugacity. Um, and as you can see, um, this is our Arai diagram. Um, they alter spectacularly. Um, so our PCRM checks, these triangles sit over these points here, they're miles away, and it's trending in the wrong, the wrong direction. Um, and if you look at the Zyderfeld, then you're seeing that actually the points are, are romping off in the, in the direction of the applied laboratory field. Um, so this is very clearly altering, even though we're measuring it in a very reduced atmosphere. Um, and actually, that was probably the problem, the fact that our atmosphere was so reducing. Um, so I did some um, rock magnetic studies on the samples before and after heating. And before, um, this is IRM acquisition, so we see we have a population of fairly low coercivity grains and then a smaller peak and slightly higher coercivity grains. Whereas after heating, um, the peaks completely change and you actually have much, much higher coercivity carriers post heating. And again, with the hysteresis behavior, it's very unstable prior to heating. And after heating, we're getting nice kind of single domain carrier signals. Um, so that was a bit, bit suspicious for us um, about what we were doing. Um, and so we used a uh, quantum dynamics microscope um, at Harvard um, just to have a quick image of the heated olivines and we kind of found what we, what we expected, um, that the magnetization is focused along the cracks. Um, and when we kind of zoomed in on the cracks using the SEM, we essentially find that they're, they're packed full of these little iron nickel um, grains. So we're basically cooking in um, ideal paleomagnetic recorders um, because the conditions are essentially too reducing. Um, so, um, and yeah, this is just the compositional map just showing that it is that basically an equal amount of iron and nickel um, and not much sulfur. So the controlled atmosphere experiments worked very well. Um, so I then went to the Rochester lab um, to use the same system that they used um, for the 2012 study, which is a bit different um, because rather than heating the samples in a paleomagnetic furnace, um, you heat them using a laser. Um, and the benefit of this method is the fact that we have much, much quicker heating and cooling times. Um, so you can heat and cool a sample in five minutes rather than heating and cooling over two or three hours. Um, and we were starting to get actually relatively promising results, um, but I was only there for about 10 days. And so I kind of looked at a few samples, whereas the work that went into the 2012 study took years. Um, and so I think the main issue is the fact that you really need to have the most ideal olivines, you really need loads of sample, loads of time, and you need lots of measurements to recover these to be stable records. Um, so just a quick sum up of kind of these two paleomagnetic approaches and good bits and bad bits of each. Um, so the benefit of using the olivines is that we have a paleo intensity approach that we understand very well. Um, if you can get nice telia telia results um, from olivines and the palisites, then you have a record you can trust. Um, but it's very, very difficult to recover these records um, because of problems with alteration. Um, and the experiments take a long time and they're really, really challenging. I mean, popping out kind of oriented olivines from these samples is, um, yeah, it takes a lot of time and effort. it's not easy to do. Um, so the cloudy zone, um, and using our synchrotron technique has, has some benefits in the sense that the sample preparation is much easier. You just need a polished surface. Um, and there's no issues with alteration because there's no heating required. 
um, but obviously it requires applying for synchrotron beam time and we're still learning exactly how to calibrate these paleo intensities. We're much more confident in the numbers we're getting now than we were a few years ago, um, but it's still, it's still a fairly novel method. Um, so I think doing both was the best thing we could possibly do, seeing, seeing how reliable um, we can get for each. Okay, so that's a whirlwind tour of, um, of kind of all the paleomagnetic side of the project. And now for kind of the more interesting bit, which is saying, now we've got this time resolved record, um, how can we use this to try and constrain the thermal evolution of the parasite parent body? So taking you back to this paleo intensity versus time um, plot that I showed you a bit earlier, um, and then this is our cloudy zone paleo intensity for each of our parasite samples again. Um, and so the constraint that this really gives us is the fact that we're assuming we have dynamo off um, when marginality and Brennan acquired kind of zero magnetic field. And then we have a dynamo um, driven by core convection when spring water in the Lacanet scale um, acquired their magnetic field record. And so the simplest assumption to make here about why you have two samples that don't record a field and then three that do is that. Um, Marjorie Larson and Brenham acquired a magnetic field before the core began to solidify. Um, so you don't have a driving mechanism um, for that, that convection. And then as soon as the core starts to solidify, you can have compositional convection, and that's driving um, a magnetic field when these three um, when these three acquired their magnetic field record. So that's given me two constraints. One is that I know that core crystallization has to happen at some point between um, this intensity record and this one. And then the second one is I know the core has to be at least partially liquid um, while all three of these acquired their magnetic field record. So those are the two constraints that I used um, for my thermal models. So I'll just briefly discuss what these thermal models look like. Um, so these are kind of the assumptions that we've, we've made to keep the model simple. So I'm assuming that the parent body um, fully differentiated um, and that it's, we basically start our models when um, the, the mantle, the silicate mantle is, is solid um, and the surface is held um, at 250 Kelvin. So the surface is cold, the mantle is solid, core is in the middle, um, and then we let it cool by conduction. Um, so keeping everything really as simple as we possibly can here. So very first order approach. Um, and this is what one of the models looks like. So um, this is the surface of the parent body. And then this is going down to the center of the planet down here. Um, and then this is basically time um, going along, along the x-axis. Um, and it's color coded in terms of its, its temperature. So, the core mantle boundary is shown by this dotted line here. Um, and essentially what we do is we let the planet cool. We know based on their cooling rates um, and when they have acquired their magnetic record, when each of our samples um, should have acquired remnants. And so our constraint is that the core needs to begin to solidify between this point and this point, which represents dynamo off and then dynamo on. Um, and then the core can't reach this point where it's completely solid um, until after this final point here. So I ran lots of different models, um, lots of different configurations of the parent body to see um, in how many situations I could basically meet these conditions. Um, and then once I'd met the conditions um, for when the core is crystallizing, I then also ran a simple dynamo model. Um, so assuming that we've got kind of inner core nucleation, so the same as what we have on Earth, um, and that the, the solidification of the inner core is driving a dynamo. Um, and for each thermal model, I also produced the paleo intensity versus time curve um, that would correspond to what the dynamo field would look like through time. Um, and then Essentially, for the next plot, I'll show you what you'll see is I'm showing average paleo intensity. So rather than having this time resolved curve, I've just taken what the average intensity while the dynamo is active would be over that time period. And so that's what I'm showing on this plot here. 
Um, I've got my, my maximum um, average intensity for my dynamo model um, versus the time it would take the core to solidify. So essentially it's my dynamo model constraint versus my thermal model constraint. Um, and then for each model that I ran, um, it's varying in terms of its, its sulfur content. Um, and so that's basically just dictating when the core begins to solidify. Um, and so this is the corresponding plot for the body size. Um, so this is showing me um, the size of the overall body in terms of its radius, and then the core size here. And then I'll just quickly show you um, a few sort of results um, that I got for, for each dynamo model um, and kind of how I how they, um, they passed my criteria, I guess, um, for explaining the data. Um, so this is an example down here, this point number two. Um, so fairly small core and parent body um, and a high sulfur content. Um, and for this one, the thermal model works in terms of when the core solidifies, but the dynamo model um, doesn't because we have two weak pay intensities and they aren't sustained for long. Um, so again, I have other examples where I get Kind of the right intensities, but they're not sustained for long enough. Um, sometimes they're too strong um, and much too early, and then it switches off. And then in some cases, they get a record that actually fits all of my early intensity data um, quite nicely. And so of all the thermal models I ran, it's actually only these four um, that gave me dynamo, corresponding dynamo models that had similar failure intensity trends to the data. And so for all of these, I've got a fairly large parent body with a fairly large core um, and relatively low sulfur contents. Um, so that was kind of good and a great starting point. But what you'll notice is that it's only just explaining the paleo intensity here. So it's the lower end of what Imlac and Scale may have recorded. Um, and if you remember, then actually the power site olivines sit up here. Um, from that Tardino 2012 study. So these are still too weak um, to explain kind of all the data sufficiently. So that got me thinking, okay, if this isn't quite the right answer to explain all the data, um, how might I be able to um, get stronger paleo intensities? And the three simplest ways of increasing the paleo intensity um, is to put palisites closer to the source of the magnetic field generating region. Um, having a shorter solidification time, um, so the longer the dynamo has to be um, active for, the, the less field it can, it can generate. Um, or having a larger core, so if you have a large core, you have more energy to generate these sort of things. Um, so this is basically telling me that I needed quite a thin mantle and quite a large core um, if I was going to explain all of those paleo intensities. So for those dynamo models I was showing you, I was thinking about kind of the classic case of um, having a solid inner core that's um, growing concentrically outwards like we have on Earth. Um, but then it actually becomes much easier to explain the palatite um, if you also consider inward crystallization, because if the outer core is actually the solid part and it's the inner core that's the convecting region. You can put the palisites much, much closer to the core because they're not next to the liquid part, so that temperature gradient becomes less of an issue. Um, and you also have much more control kind of over the cooling history and how long you have to um, have an active dynamo for um, this mechanism. So this is the thermal model I've already shown you. Um, uh, outward crystallization, and then I ran similar models um, for inward crystallization. So at this point, the core begins to solidify at the core mantle boundary, and then it solidifies towards the center instead. Um, and you'll see here the main dis difference is I've got a much smaller mantle in this case, and the palisites have all acquired their magnetic field records much closer together um, than in this case, where they're much, much more spread out. Um, so it just gives me kind of more parameters to be able to play with by considering both scenarios. Um, so there's a lot going on in this plot. Um, so I'll try and kind of explain um, everything briefly. So um, on the y-axis, I have the minimum dynamo duration. So that's 
the minimum time required for it to have um, captured the magnetic field um, record of spring water and IMLAC and SCL. And then on the x-axis, I've got the mantle thickness. Um, and then the size of these points um, corresponds to the size of the core. So big points are a big core and small points are a little core. Um, and then outward core solidification like we have on Earth, shown in red, and then inward solidification is shown in blue. Um, so essentially, um, just what this shows you is that if you have outward crystallization, you've got to have quite a large mantle um, to have a thermal model that works. And so the power sites are quite spread out in space um, and in terms of the time of acquiring a record. Whereas for inward crystallization, you can have a much thinner mantle and you can actually squeeze them all together and still have core crystallization at the right time, but they, they will have cooled in very, very kind of quick succession um, within the mantle. So this is kind of interesting because if we want to distinguish between these two, if we can date the power sites um, using a thermochron um, thermochronology, um, then we can start to distinguish between um, which of these is more, more likely. But the interesting thing um, that I found in terms of explaining the, the stronger paleo intensities, so again here I've got paleo intensity on the y-axis and mantle thickness on the x-axis is the, the olivine inclusions um, that were measured in 2012, they sit in this yellow box here. Um, whereas the cloudy zone paleo intensities that I've measured sit in the green box here. So where the two overlap and all the studies are in agreement, only works if we have a very, very large core and very thin mantle. And actually the direction of crystallization doesn't seem to matter so much. Um, so we might be able to distinguish between these two using thermochrom, um, but both work in terms of giving us these much stronger um, paleo intensities um, over time. So finally, does this allow me to actually say something about what the parent body looked like? Um, and thinking back to those, um, those formation mechanisms I talked about at the start. Um, and so... The main conclusion to take away is the fact that um, I think the paleo intensities are telling us you've got to have a large cord, thin mantled um, parent body. And this is very similar um, to what's been suggested for this ferrovulcanism um, mechanism. So again, here you have a large core, um, these sulfur rich dikes that can then you have um, kind of not much overpressure because the mantle is thin and so they can intrude into that mantle. Um, and so this mechanism can kind of explain the textures that we see in the parasites, and it can also explain the paleomagnetic record. Um, so this is kind of indicating that perhaps um, inward core solidification is more plausible um, if we want to explain both of these things. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, the reason that this is kind of a particular interest at the moment is because of the upcoming mission to the asteroid psyche. And so um, I just did some kind of back of the envelope calculations, um, just assuming one density for the core and one density for the mantle of each of my um, thermal models. I calculated what the density of that planetesimal would be just to see if they were in any way consistent um, with the densities that have been observed for the psyche. Um, and what we find is that for the, for the plant assessments with very, very large cores, the densities were a bit too high. Um, but actually, for a lot of the models um, that have paleo intensities that are consistent with the cloudy zone, um, they are also a similar density to psyche. Um, and it's been suggested that actually palisites might be the kind of material um, we'll see on the surface um, of Psyche. So that was kind of just a fun kind of, you know, maybe, maybe it is from a, from a similar plant. Um, okay, so just to finish up. Um, so in summary, um, they might be from, from a planet that looks a little bit like Psyche. Um, so something which is mostly metallic, but it does still have a silicate layer um, at its surface. To distinguish between inward and outward core solidification, we really need to use something like thermochrom, um, and having an independent constraint would really, really help us to, to nail down what's happening 
um, on the parent body and actually how the parasites form. Um, and in my opinion, at least, I think ferrovolcanism is looking um, like a plausible mechanism and perhaps more plausible and easier to explain um, than having impact melts and having to actually inject more material um, down from the surface. Um, so thank you very much for listening to that kind of whirlwind tour um, of the paper. I'm very happy to, to take any questions. Well, thank you, Claire. It was really exciting talks on some really challenging uh, materials to work with. Um, if people want to give her um, sort of a virtual applause, there's some um, emojis or, or whatnot in, in Zoom, and otherwise we can open up for questions. Uh, oh, go on. Well, if, uh, um, it, while we wait for others, uh, I guess, Clara, have you started to think about the um, other palisites besides, besides main groups? Is that, is that on your horizon? Yeah, potentially. Um, I would really, really like to look at the Eagle Station palisites. Um, there's very few museums that want to give examples. Um, the other interesting thing, there was actually a study that came out, I think last year, that subdivided the main group palisites in terms of their isotopic compositions again. Um, so it actually looks like there might be two, two bodies instead of one. Um, so I think that's something I'm kind of interested in looking at is are they two different um, or, or do they both look, both look like this? Um, so yeah, we'll have to see. Simon. Yeah, great talk, Claire. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering how this, with a thin, solid outer core, uh, how that kicks off the um, the dynamo with the compositional convection sort of thing. Yeah, so that's a good question, and it's actually something I kind of dodged around in the sense that um, there's a there's a really good paper. Um, by Jerome Neufeld, who's a fluid dynamicist uh, at Cambridge, um, who worked with James Bryson on the 4A iron meteorites, because they look like they crystallized from the outside in and it generated the dynamo. Um, so it's not particularly well understood exactly how that drives a dynamo yet, but they've kind of shown mathematically that it, it does. Um, so I didn't really try and model how that dynamo would work. I just looked at the, the maximum amount of energy the core would have in that scenario to generate paleo intensities. Um, but yeah, so I think it's it's kind of still up for debate exactly how that would work. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from um, Brainer. I hope I got that right. Yes, yeah, so currently I am um doing my master with this main group media and parasite and then i don't know how much i can talk about my data but uh, my data shows something like the camasite looking thing it's intruding into the uh torerite formation so uh with only looking at this and like FES sort of material, FENIS sort of material mm -hmm. is intruding from core to the mantle area is not supporting. So like, I'm wondering what it's going on. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, that's that's interesting to hear um, because obviously that that is something you should be able to see, right? If it is the sulfur rich um, kind of metallic is coming up from the core and intruding to the mantle, you should see a lot of sulfur rich material um, in the palisites. Um, so I think that's another interesting line of evidence that I've not really thought very much about is looking at these things um, compositionally, but that, that could well rule out that mechanism. Um, it just fits very nicely with paleo intensity observations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, you only mentioned it briefly, Claire, to be fair, but um, how, what, like, under what conditions, do you know under what conditions you get, um, like, incomplete differentiation? 
Yeah, so um, you would basically get incomplete differentiation if you're cooling everything too quickly. So differentiation is really efficient if the entire body is molten, then you can very effectively just remove all the metal um, from the silicate melt. Whereas if the body forms relatively cold um, and you actually solidify the silicate and you have um, basically olivines that are interconnected, so they're all touching, um, then depending on what the dihedral angle is, and I must confess, I cannot remember off the top of my head what it should be or shouldn't be, um, but if the, I think if the angle is basically between the olivines are too narrow, then the melt can't percolate through. So any metal that's left at that point just gets stuck. Um, I personally don't think that is a reasonable explanation for most of the palisites because I mean, well, you can even see just in this picture here, the metal is interconnected. So there's no reason for it not to percolate through. Um, but it does explain kind of small patches that we see in some palisites. Right, thank you.